Now, for this week's competition, I'd like you to provide an apt and amusing caption for this freeze frame from Fletch. The prize will be a year's free rental of videos from any Granada store. <laughs> Never mind what they're saying to each other in the actual script, what do you think they ought to be saying to each other? Entries on a postcard, and only on a postcard, please, by next Monday to Film 85, BBC Television, London, W12, 8QT. And so to another of the week's new offerings, The Holcroft Covenant. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. This is taken from an overblown thriller by Robert Ludlam and looks suspiciously like another of those films that Michael Caine makes from time to time when, having nothing much to do for a few weeks, he just takes the money and runs. It all revolves around a covenant made just before their deaths in Berlin in 1945 by three Nazi generals who consign a fortune to be used for the good of mankind by their offspring in 40 years' time. Forty years on, one of these offspring turns out to be the well-known New York architect Michael Caine. Another is the even more famous conductor Mario Adolf, while two more are Victoria Tennant, who must have been a good ten years away from conception when her father died, and her brother Anthony Andrews, about whom all we know at first is that he writes brilliant but mysterious articles for The Guardian. Well, that's no help. Practically everybody on The Guardian writes brilliant but mysterious articles. Anyway, the covenanted fortune now amounts to four and a half billion dollars, which quite phases Mr Caine. I can't imagine four and a half billion dollars, he says. I can imagine four and a half million. This presumably is to establish him as a simple man of the people whose financial expectations are really very modest. Now then, helping or rather confusing the task of sorting out from this motley lot which are the good guys and which are the bad guys who want to use the money to establish the Fourth Reich are Lily Palmer looking magnificent as Mr Kane's mum and Richard Munch as an aged anti-Nazi in a bath chair who is highly cynical about the whole business and I'm with him. The dialogue, I may tell you, calls upon Mr Kane to deliver in an emotional voice such lines as she is there, risking her life with that murderer, and there is not a damn thing I can do. The director of this limping turkey was John Frankenheimer, who used to be pretty good back in the days of the Manchurian Candidate and the Birdman of Alcatraz. But enough already. Here's Mr Munch unjustly accusing Mr Kane of wanting the money for nasty Nazi purposes. I am trying to stay calm. But if somebody doesn't tell me why I am here, what British intelligence... Mr Holcroft, let me be brief and to the point. You are here to reassure me that your four and a half billions will not be used for any purpose of which I disapprove. As far as I know, the Covenant doesn't say anything about a Mr. Oberst having to countersign my checks. And how the hell do you know about all this anyway? To enlighten you, sir, I'm the head of Wolfschanze. It is our function to make sure the horrors of the Third Reich are never repeated again anywhere in the world. I, a Clausen, indulge an old man. Convince me that you are not a member of the neo-Nazis. Indeed, that you are not their anointed leader, and that these vast sums will not be spent to create a fourth Reich. I don't believe this. I do not believe what I am hearing. My name is Noel Holcroft. I am an architect. I am a foreign-born American citizen, which means that I can do anything over there except become president. You guys are as obsessed as my mother. Convince me, please. Tell, for example, how you plan to use this money. I don't have to tell you or anybody else one goddamn thing. But, my dear sir, you do. You do. Otherwise, I will kill you. Well, as one who remains through thick and thin a dogged admirer of Mr. Kane, I'm expecting much better things of his next film, Hannah and Her Sisters, which he's just finished making with Woody Allen, Mia Farrow and Carrie Fisher. Won't be seen here, though, until next year. Well, finally tonight, we have Code of Silence, with Chuck Norris as the Rambo of the Chicago police force, dealing out retribution indiscriminately to both mafiosi and South American drug runners in John McEnroe headbands. His life is somewhat complicated by the fact that he has to keep a fatherly, well, I suspect not all that fatherly eye, on Molly Hagan, the teenage daughter of a runaway gangster, and also by the fact that his fellow detectives won't lift a finger to help him because he testified at a police hearing against some gun-happy old cop. If the code of silence operates among the gangsters, the police code seems to run more on the lines of up yours, Jack. Still, Mr Norris battles on, indomitable and invincible, and equally adept with firearms and the kung fu stuff. It's a sort of down-market dirty Harry, and quite enjoyable in a violent sort of way. So, for tonight, and until the same time next week, let me leave you with Mr Norris literally on top of the situation. Goodbye. <coughs> One 
one step. I cut a head off. Give it up. Next Monday on Radio 4, Terence Pettigrew looks at the true character behind the legend of James Dean, with the help of Carol Baker, Adam Faith and Ray Connolly. You're tearing me apart at 7.20 on Monday evening on Radio 4. And just a reminder that Rebel Without a Cause, the film which gave James Dean his most identifiable role, is on BBC Two on Sunday evening at 5 past 10. Here on One, in half an hour, the cult will be late night in concert at London's Lyceum. First, O'Donnell investigates food and asks, where did we go wrong? Oh.